Fantastic. <clears throat> it is so good to be here with you tonight, and thank you for being the diehards, the people who will come even at 5.30 in the evening, but I, I understand the pull of this session. Um, obesity is one of those topics that I think everyone, everyone deals with personally, and if it's not our own struggles with weight, it's people we love. Um, but the chance to discuss this on the macro level, the costs of it, the solutions. We have a fascinating group here. I'm, I'm not going to, I, I'm not the star. These are the stars sitting with me, so I'm going to introduce them. Uh, at the end, we have Glenn Tolman, the Chief Executive Officer of Transparent. Next to Glenn, we have Dr. Matt, and please, correct my, spell, uh, my pronunciation, Mads Krosgaard Thompson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Novo Nordisk Foundation. I know you have a lot of insight into this. Uh, next to Mads is Dr. Shamshir Vialil. Yes, spell it right, yeah. <laughs> and next to me is Nancy Brown. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Vialil is the founder and chairman of the Bergil Holdings PLC, and maybe you'll tell us a little about sure, that. Sure. And next to me is Nancy Brown, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Heart Association. I'm Amy Bernstein. I'm the editor of Harvard Business Review. And you know, when I was invited to, to do this panel, I, the first, my first thought went to some family members who um, lost 50 and 60 pounds each on, wait for it, Ozempic and has changed their lives. They're off their heart medica their, their blood pressure medications, they have energy, they're doing wonderfully. Um, but I also know that our readers who are organizational leaders are really, are, are really thinking about this in terms of both wellness and as a health challenge. And what they're struggling with is how to address it in their own organizations. So uh, with that, I'd love to open the conversation I have a wonderful script here that I'm going to follow to some extent. But um, I'd love to, to open the conversation with a question to Glenn about you know, the investments that healthcare providers, actually, I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to, I'm going to start differently. I would like to get from you, Nancy. <laughs> A sense of the of the kind of macro challenge, the healthcare challenge. Sure. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Obesity is an issue that we have cared deeply about at the American Heart Association for decades. We first named obesity as an official risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, including stroke, back in the 1990s. And we recognize over those many decades, obesity is one of many risk factors that can elevate your risk of having a heart attack, a stroke, or another um, you know, serious uh, health, chronic health issue. You know, obesity, you know, uh, along with proper nutrition, exercise, controlling your blood pressure, your blood cholesterol, your blood sugar, um, um, your body mass index, not using tobacco, and getting enough sleep are what we call the official risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And you can see the connection of obesity to several of these other risk factors, nutrition, exercise, um, blood glucose, blood, uh, uh, blood cholesterol levels, and blood pressure. Um, they are all related. And we know that obesity, as it stands, is very complex. It's a combination of biologic issues, genetic issues, epigenetic issues, societal issues, behavioral issues. And so finding a one solution fits all is really um, you know, not the answer. And I think we'll have good agreement on that on this panel today. The alarming thing is the growing rate of overweight and obesity in the United States and around the world. You know, we have 40% um, of U.S. adults in, in the United States adults that are obese. Um, we have a large percentage of young children aged 2 to 19 who are obese or significantly obese. And these um, numbers and trends uh, are seeing their way around the world. So we must find a comprehensive set of solutions that can provide healthcare providers 
in partnership with patients uh, the tools that they need to help people manage their weight so that they can live a longer, healthier life. We know that excess body weight does directly lead to the other risk factors that I mentioned. So it's a critical public health issue and one that we're determined uh, to work to address. how to address this, okay? And I'd love to go down the row and start with you, Glenn, about the potential solutions that you see out there, um, both uh, in terms of their effectiveness and what excites you in your business. Sure. Um, well, TransCare is focused on one place for all your health and care, focused in the U.S., and the idea is how do we make it easy for people to access high-quality, affordable health and care? And in doing that, of course, obesity is one of the key challenges. Now, what Nancy said is exactly right, and that is there's not one solution that fits everyone. And yet, what we really need is one place to go so people know those solutions are all available. And I'll say something sitting next to Mads here that, that may be provocative. We're in a unique time in this whole space. And it's unique because of that name that everybody around the world knows, GLP-1s. Mm -hmm. And yet, I don't think GLP-1s are the answer. However, they are a critical part of the solution, and I don't think we've ever had an opportunity like we have incorporating GLP-1s in a more comprehensive solution for what we call weight health. And that's a, a bugaboo of mine. My last company was called Lavango, focused on diabetes care. And it always bothered us when people called someone a diabetic. And so, you know, I would have loved if, if I had a chance to name this session, and we wouldn't talk about obesity, but we talk about weight health, because that's really what we're talking about. GLP-1s, great upfront planning and counseling, and in some cases, bariatric surgery, all of that fits into a comprehensive approach that I think we have to take. And our focus is working with the largest employers around the world, and particularly in the US, to help pay for those solutions and get solutions that are cost effective and that last. Because again, improperly used, a GLP-1 is not a lasting solution. Properly used, it can absolutely change someone's life. So what we have to think about is what's the comprehensive plan? And that's one of the things we do at Transparent in terms of offering one place for weight health is what we call it. Mads, what do you think of what Glenn just said? Well, first of all, I, I think it's one of the most uh, complex um, conditions we can imagine. Uh, Nancy alluded to it. We have polygenic risk factors that predispose some more than others yet people get stigmatized even though it's not their fault, they're genetically predisposed. We have pregnant women with a even epigenetic imprinting of the fetus that is then later on predisposed to develop obesity. So there's so many things we need to think about socioeconomically and even before a woman even gets pregnant with a child. But once you have obesity, we know it's as chronic a condition as hyperglycemia, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, so it is chronic. And, and I think the good news is that with the advent of, of, of these new pharmacotherapies, they're not the solution in their own right, but they do make it possible to break the vicious cycle. And the vicious cycle is one where whenever you try to diet, you lose weight, your basic metabolic rate drops as a consequence to try to counteract that from a genetic perspective so you get back up there. So, so now at least we have an opportunity to combine diet and exercise, uh, better behavioral uh, situations with pharmacotherapy, uh, and at the same time, uh, get these people a, a belief in the future. Because it has been a yo-yo situation where people have tried many things, they fall back within a year or two, try again, etc. So I think what we need is really multifactorial intervention, which involves dietitians, uh, coaches on physical exercise, pharmacotherapy, at least in, in many cases, uh, and a better understanding of this as a, a true chronic condition, I would call it a disease, as does WHO, that calls for significant change. If I were Nancy, I would probably also think that most of the cardiometabolic disease that happens nowadays, including heart failure, the so-called HFPEF, is driven by obesity. Mm -hmm. If you were a cardiologist 50 years ago, 
it would be much less and driven by other factors. So obesity is even a risk factor for 14, 15 different cancers, actually exceeding the risk of tobacco smoking in many, many countries. So I think we need to take it as it is, a complex problem that calls for many different parts of the healthcare community to, to intervene. So Shamshir, you're a physician, you're the founder of one of the leading healthcare systems in the Middle East. What do you think of what you're hearing here? So if you ask my experience, I had a close brush with, in 2017, she was called as the world's heaviest woman. So I went to see her in her apartment in Egypt. She was locked in a room for almost many years. So all they were doing was the family moves her around, and then we have to use a crane, break the wall of the, the flat, use a cargo flight. We, we looked after her for almost six, seven months, then she passed away. But again, uh, I think it's something that we have to look at as a whole, as a family as a whole, because it's not just somebody who's obese is suffering, it's the whole family that is. It's a systems problem. It, it's, a, it's a huge issue if you go to schools, the, the, the stigma associated with it, uh, you know, how you can differentiate from a metabolic <coughs> to an endocrine problem, uh, how the school teach, we, we have a catering company as well, along, along the hospitals, we thought we should do something for the schools, we started a kitchen, we used the dietitians. We were planning the meals, so, we realized that how after COVID, especially with the lockdowns and the easy access to Uber Eats and all of them, mm -hmm. food has become so easy to access and the fast food culture uh, with all due regards. Again, there is an intrinsic cultural aspect that is you know, changed in this current scenario because if you look at the Middle East, right now there's a change where previously it was just the, 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 the father going to work, but now we have all of us going for work. Uh, wives go to work. Everyone uh, is not at home. So again, the child is left alone. Schools have to be more responsible. We need to look at it as a societal issue as well. So we cannot just look at just as a GLP alone. We used to do close to 10,000 surgeries a year just for uh, metabolic uh, disorders. And now with, with GLP ones, that has reduced. But I don't think, like you said, it's not going to be a solution. We have to look at it as a whole. And I think mental health is a huge issue. Uh, the, the stigma around it is also a problem. People are called with uh, second names, which uh, even in the Indian culture, you can, you can hear someone called along their life with the, with the names associated with their uh, you know, problems. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue. I don't think even it could be an epic, could be a pandemic as well coming very soon if you don't address it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we, Nancy, uh, you know, with the, with the advent of GLP um, medications, which I'm sure just mentioned COVID, are we at a, at a particular turning point? Is this moment different in your view? I think this is a very different moment. You know, whenever um, a new solution comes into the marketplace um, that can be a tool in the toolbox along a continuum, I think it is a big moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we recognize, the, um, first of all, and we believe strongly at the American Heart Association that healthcare should be done in partnership between the patient and the healthcare provider. So, you know, if this tool is available um, and can help someone uh, that is deemed to need this tool, I think it can be very, very effective. Um, we also know that the GLPs, uh, as at least as um, uh, presented in a late-breaking clinical trial at our scientific sessions meeting in November, um, for some people with existing vascular disease, they've had a heart attack, they've had a stroke, they have peripheral vascular disease, and they were overweight with no diabetes, um, it showed an improvement in other cardiovascular risk factors. And clearly, the more work there needs to be done and continued studies need to be done, uh, both to validate that and to expand the group of persons who were studied. But you know, these are important moments you know, in history when new solutions come into the marketplace and the market has to you know, settle around how best to integrate them into play. So yeah, the market has to decide. Glenn, you're very close to the market. You deal with employers. How are they thinking about this? Well, I think this has come on very quickly. And most employers are not covering GLP-1s today. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first issue. And what they're saying to us is they want a comprehensive program. They want data 
to show how it works. Um, that said, you know, if you look at the numbers, um, as, as Nancy mentioned, four out of 10 Americans fall into this category um, already, and one out of every three Americans has said they'd like to try a GLP-1. So this is going to come together. The way it'll probably work out in the U.S. is normally when something is categorized as a disease, the government begins to cover it, and then once the government begins to cover it, businesses follow. But they're really screaming for a more comprehensive approach to GLP-1s as opposed to take this medication, don't change anything else, don't change your lifestyle, don't change your exercise patterns, maybe continue taking it, maybe don't. That's what we're seeing a lot of today. So I think there's real concerns because if you take the current price points and you do the math, it'll break the healthcare system in the United States. Some would argue that's already broken in terms of how much we spend. Um, so we have to figure out a more comprehensive approach. But it, so I just wonder, given the severity and the uh, and this and, and just the magnitude of this problem, whether that kind of thinking is letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean, Mats, how do you think about this? First of all, uh, I think the, the big benefit, whether it's bariatric surgery or, or these uh, rather efficacious new medicines, uh, one big benefit is that uh, a lot of the accompanying comorbidities. I mean, most of the patients we studied in the company uh, would um, either have knee arthrosis, they would have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, maybe sleep apnea, maybe um, a cardiac condition, et cetera, et cetera. That, that very often what, uh, and I can see a lady in, in the room here working with techno gym, physical exercise tools, uh, we see many, many people who just the sheer fact that they lose 15, 18, 20% of the weight enables them to start doing physical um, exercise programs that they simply couldn't do because of the pain before. So I would agree with everything that's being said. These things have to go hand in hand. We should bear in mind that over time, you know, in the old days, insulin was expensive. Uh, then four generations went off patent over a period of 100 years. I foresee that GLP-1 will be a, a, a volume medicine for many people, including those in, in low and middle income countries that very often suffer a, a double burden of disease. With both will the prices come down? Over time, yes. Okay. There will also be more competitors. Patents will yeah. expire. We are right now only at the, the beginning of the era of pharmacotherapy. And mm -hmm. I think also the companies have realized that. They probably underestimated even the, the, the demand situation. So, it, I mean, it makes sense you need a multifactorial approach. But you have to start somewhere, don't you? Nancy, where do you start? Do you mean as the individual or as society? Well, as a, I'm, let me, uh, HBR. Employers. Where should yes. employers start? You know, I, um, we work a lot with employers as well at the American Heart Association. Um, and I think employers are seeking information and data. This is a market-driven trend of employees asking employers, what are you going to do about these new drugs? Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't, you know, when a new blood pressure medication comes along or a new cholesterol medication, hardly is there a line at the door of HR saying, mm -hmm. you know, may I have this new cholesterol medication? It gets worked out through the insurance provider, the doctor, and the patient generally offline. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation about the GLPs, what they are, what the studies, who, what mark, uh, populations have been studied. Um, you know, now many employers, of course, cover the GLPs for persons with type 2 diabetes. Um, it, that data has been clear, and employers understand the importance of bringing down the risk um, that type 2 diabetics have. I think this cost-benefit analysis work needs to be done not at an individual employer level, but there needs to be a better understanding of the cost of an individual to, you know, short term to take the medication. And then there's a long term cost of individuals who are obese on an employee sponsored health plan because of the other chronic conditions that they develop. So, mm -hmm. you know, this, it, you know, this is all just kind of shown up, right? And so we're getting many, many questions from employers looking for guidance on what to do, how to think about this. And, you know, at the American Heart Association, we always follow the science and we follow our public policy agenda. And I might just say that we've had a very extensive public policy agenda on the obesity topic in the U.S. that's 
starts with um, things like access to behavioral counseling, access to nutrition services, access to physical activity uh, reimbursements for certain kinds of physical activity, access to bariatric surgery. All of these things along the continuum are part of the things that we advocate for. This will be another tool in that toolbox. Mm -hmm. But I do think the confusion will be more than employers are prepared for just based upon the individual demand. Well, let I, me think, I think, though, there's another issue with employers, and this is a broader health care issue, but it will come to fore here, particularly with GLP-1s, and that is if you're an employer, you're managing quarter to quarter if you're a public company and year over year. And so doing the right thing in that 12-month period isn't always possible and isn't always, they aren't looking at a five-year span. Right. And I think if we look at a five-year span, again, what we've heard is you'll see all kinds of reductions in other comorbidities, which would be a wonderful thing, um, but they're not, many of the employers are not looking at a five-year span. In fact, we have industries where the turnover, they're turning over 50, 70 percent of their people in a year. And so the idea of investing in prevention right. or in these drugs um, is much less appealing, particularly as the economy tightens. So we really do need a new kind of model. And that's true for GLP-1s, but it's also true for, you know, if you look at hepatitis C, there's now a cure. But the cure over five years, it's cost justified. Over one year, it's very tough for an employer to say, I'll pay for it with the risk of someone leaving. So I think that's unique to employers and um, very different. So I'd love to hear your perspective, Shamshir. From I spoke to a lot of physicians who took uh, GLP-1s and they seem to be very happy about the feel-good effect. Uh, so they think that it improves the productivity. So I think from an employer perspective, it definitely improves the, the feel-good aspect of the employer, because it's, it's an immediate win, because others take time. If you come with exercise as medicine or food as medicine, it all takes time. But this one gives them a, a quick return, because I think the productivity aspect improves, and there's a feel-good effect which comes with it, although we don't know how long it's going to stay. So is it feel-good for the employee or feel-good for the employer? If the employee feels good, the employer definitely right. you know benefits out of it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think, I think it's a kind of too early, but I think it's a good start. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of physicians taking it now, but my worry is the misuse of it, making it go beyond, beyond the point, and I think that's what we need to be careful about. And we see already yeah. in the United States supply chain issues, you know, persons who stock. are type 2 <laughs> diabetics that can't get their medication right. because of the flood to the market for individuals wanting to use the product for weight loss. And so all of that has to get straightened out. And again, this has come on so rapidly um, that I think the promise is, is so exciting but so many issues to think through and work out. So then let's, let's talk about that. I, you know, you're passionate about education, yes. right? Um, and certainly the GLP drugs have, have triggered a new kind of conversation about this. How does it, has that changed the way you think about education and the other factors towards solving this problem? You know, I think we um, spend a lot of time and resources educating consumers and the public mm -hmm. um, in the United States and in many markets uh, around the world, actually. <laughs> and, you know, people are seeking to understand. They want knowledge. They want solutions. They want tools. You know, one of the most uh, interesting and one of the most um, commonly asked uh, pieces of content from the American Heart Association is actually recipes, believe it or not. Well, huh? People want recipes. And so, you know, we have thought a lot about how to make sure that we are giving patients questions to ask their physicians, that we're helping individuals understand the suite of solutions <coughs> they should be thinking about. I think we all agree on this Stage, the worst thing that could happen would be if there was a disregard <laughs> for the importance of physical activity and proper nutrition. Um, because at the end of the day, um, losing weight is one thing, but you know there is a syndrome that we recently have defined and announced at the same meeting, by the way, um, the uh, uh, CKM, cardiocaine <coughs> metabolic syndrome, um, which is a syndrome of how all of those factors come together. And it's complicated and has many components. <coughs> 
and we must be thinking about all of them. And so we are focused at the AHA of doing the things we do, whether it's through our policy change work, uh, whether it is through our work in communities, our work um, in digital content, our work with healthcare providers, our work with scientists, our work in helping to explain the science. You know, the trial that I mentioned that was presented at our meeting was a huge uh, area of interest for the media. And, you know, all we spent three days explaining to the media so they could explain to the t public exactly what the trial was. It was not a weight loss trial. It was a trial for persons with existing vascular disease. So, you know, I think that, that we are being called on and we're up for the challenge of making mm -hmm. sure that people know and understand. And one of the biggest things I think that we all can do is make sure that we're equipping people with questions, not giving them answers necessarily, but making sure that they are have questions to ask their doctor, to ask themselves um, about how all of these things fit in their lifestyle. That's named Matt. Yep, I, I fully agree, Nancy. Um, I would say, uh, as a foundation, we, we fund a center of childhood health, which is about prevention of childhood and adolescent obesity. And one of the findings we've done in, in some of the research we've supported is that it all starts uh, preschool. We need, in, in, and we were at a session a couple of days uh, yes. ago together, um, we actually need to consider already at a kindergarten level, educating kids about food, mm -hmm. about junk food versus healthy food, in such a way that they get it, they will actually transfer some of their insights to the family. This is a family-driven condition quite often. That, that's where it all needs to start. We need to create governmental support for the fact that we need um, healthy school food that actually also avoids the socioeconomic skewing where rich children maybe get healthy salads and so on, and many others, um, they go to, to get some junk food at the local bar. There, there are so many things we can do to kind of level the playing field between the different uh, socioeconomic strata. But as Professor Copeland, the former, former, former CDC director said, you need to take care of those below year, uh, 18 years of age, because that's where your brain has the plasticity to truly uh, change behavior. At our age, it's great what you're doing, Nancy, but to, to cope with this four decades from now and, and break the curve of the growing obesity uh, uh, pandemic, we, we need to, to start early. Yeah, Maz, I couldn't agree more. You know, 10 years ago, actually, more like 12, the American Heart Association and the Clinton Foundation created the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which is focused on children's health and obesity. And we actually um, have a very uh, sophisticated process of recognizing schools that create healthy environments for children around nutrition, exercise, mental health, and resilience. Um, it's a very important way. The program is focused mostly in um, disadvantaged communities in the United States. States. And with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we created Voices for Healthy Kids, which is an advocacy program where we're spending millions of dollars a year in communities changing public policies. Things like, as an example, in some communities, access to safe places to exercise is a really big problem. So changing policies in communities so that schools are open after hours for families to get exercise sounds like a very simple thing not so simple at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I ag completely agree, starting with youth uh, is, is very, very important. And making sure that we also focus on the triggers that might create a spiraling of unhealthy behaviors in youth. And this is where we <coughs> at the AHA have been very focused on um, the targeting of individuals in certain communities to um, you know, high salt, high sugar products, beverages, and foods, and certainly tobacco products. It starts with people in young ages, and there's absolutely targeting going on, and that needs to stop as well. So before we go to questions from you, our audience, I'd love to get a sense of, you know, if we are going to solve this problem for access, for equity, what, is, you know, what is the single most important place to look, where do we start? And I'll go down the line. Um, I'll start with you, Glenn. Well, I think um, if you talk about access and equity, you have to talk about the government. Um, and it needs to be covered by, you know, governmental programs which focus in, in uh, again, at least in the United States, primarily on the underserved, under-resourced mm -hmm. populations. 
Um, that said, I think the employers will, for all of the reasons that were mentioned, um, they want to keep their good employees happy. They want to keep them employed. This is kind of a consumer-driven drug. Unlike many of the drugs, consumers want this, <clears throat> and they feel better. So for all those, I think employers will get there. I think it will be a little choppy, and I think with help you know, from the American Heart Association and others creating comprehensive programs like the one we offer, um, which say there's one place to go independent of what solution you need, I think also destigmatizing this. So again, I'd like to get rid of the word obesity, talk about weight health, because that's what we're all saying. We're saying if you manage your weight, you're going to be healthier. And that's a good thing that everybody, no matter how much you weigh, should be thinking about, um, as opposed to putting people into this obesity category, which is a negative. There's no question people see that as a negative. So I think it's a combination. And we need all hands on deck because this is moving from um, a epidemic to, you know, uh, something well beyond that, a pandemic. And it's, and it's worldwide. Mm -hmm. Matt? Well, uh, we've discussed the socioeconomics. Even in Denmark, taking people with a low level of education as compared to academic education have a five times increased risk of obesity and a three times increased risk of additional comorbidities. So I would focus as a government agency a lot on the vulnerable populations, those who are uh, socioeconomically exposed to, to a very high risk and start early, as I mentioned, because everyone goes to kindergarten. Everyone doesn't go to university. If you start early, there's a chance we can break the vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also realize that there are definitely people who are, are able to um, handle this themselves. Those are not the ones that, that, that need help. And then I think uh, also to, uh, quite honestly, follow the evidence. Because the, the best evidence we have today is that it's a combination of things. One thing, uh, I mean, yes, you increase your lean body mass by, by exercising, but you compensate late on in the day by turning down your, your basal metabolic rate, and, and overall you become a healthier body composition, but you need to add something, such as healthy food, or maybe sometimes pharmaceutical intervention. Mm -hmm. So a multifactorial intervention with a special focus on vulnerable populations. And I think we need a hybrid solution. We need some historically used techniques like sugar tax and tobacco tax, which has helped, and we don't want GLPs to be the only uh, go-to solution for this because then I think there's an easy solution for it and we don't want uh, uh, this to become another problem. So mm -hmm. we need to think of this issue not just as a Ministry of Health handling this because we want the Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, because it's related to all. Mm -hmm. So we will need to rewrite the, the rules of engagement, especially with kids being too smart these days. We cannot just convince them easily. We need to really show them what it looks like. We cannot create role models by just doing <coughs> DLPs. Then they get to fall for the, the fan craze easily at these days. So I think we need to look at it in a hybrid mode where we give them some values. We teach them things in the house plus schools because school that alone won't be enough because we have seen that people go home and eat what they want. Mm -hmm. So again, like Nancy said, it's so difficult to make them engaged in the schools because they look forward for going just that at four o'clock where they go back and do what they want to do. So I think we have to look at the data. We need to, to see what model works best because it works, what works in US doesn't work in Middle East. What mm -hmm. works in, in the developed world doesn't work in the African part of uh, the world. So I think this is the time that we need to look at it differently. We need to bring the pharmaceutical, we need to bring the governments, we need to bring uh, multi-stakeholder level meetings. We need to call for action, uh, enough of uh, thought leaders. We need doers to, to, to implement things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Nancy? Um, I would agree with Glenn, policy change. You know, if you want a large scale change in society around health related issues, it has to start with policy change. And, um, you know, thinking about the spectrum of tools in the toolbox, how are they covered, especially for those persons at the greatest health risk, um, in this case, maybe those who are most obese or, or have the, uh, the likelihood to be most obese, or those who can't otherwise afford treatments. You know, mm -hmm. we cannot leave people behind. Right, right. And, and we don't forget the mothers 
because there's increasing evidence that treating a person, a woman, a couple that wants to become pregnant and reduce weight even before pregnancy yes. reduces the hormonal and metabolic imbalances and the epigenetic imprinting in the fetus. There's something we can do to help the next generation, quite simple, by losing some kilos of weight uh, even pre-pregnancy, according to the latest data. Okay, excellent. Well, now we want your questions. If you'd raise your hand, we have people with mics around the room, they'll come right to you. Uh, any questions? Do I see one over there? No. Yeah, there's one. Oh yes, right there. Thank you very much. Um, obviously America has one of the highest obesity rates and the reason is largely because it's got the biggest food industry. And um, I just wondered what the panel's view about how, we, how you would regulate the food industry and what more needs to be done. And also with the advent of <coughs> therapies, does that reduce the need to regulate the food industry or not? I'd be happy to start on that. Um, I have very strong feelings uh, about that. So um, I think there are three things to consider. First of all, with the onset of these new therapies, it does not change many simple facts, and that is that unhealthy food products are targeted to persons in disadvantaged communities. And so... The, you know, we, you mentioned sugary beverage taxes, you know, trying to um, work in partnership with food companies to change the way that they promote uh, their products uh, to certain populations is very important. I, I remember um, uh, years ago having a large food company uh, come and visit us at the American Heart Association, and in a casual comment, th this is a company that has a number of um, fast, casual restaurants, they talked about the fact that the plate size in restaurants used to be seven inches and now it is 11 inches in the United States. And so portion control matters um, a lot. And, you know, uh, we live in a consumer driven society. So people equate size, amount of food to value. And I think that is going to be very hard to change. But holding food companies accountable to not targeting individuals with unhealthy products is one thing. Number two, our government, um, the FDA specifically, has a really important role. You know, we have advocated strongly, and the FDA has recently adopted um, voluntary targets for, for example, <coughs> sodium levels in food products, which is directly related to elevated blood pressure, but also on other unhealthy um, food behaviors. There are many good actors, you know, companies that are trying to do the right things, but not all companies are there. And so, you know, we as advocates have to keep the pressure on on behalf of the people that we serve. And I think also to add on to that is the shopping habits have changed. It's yes. online shopping and it's so easy to access. So if you could look at the shopping cards, you can see people have started to buy more portions and quantities. So that also needs to change. So there needs to be a big educational activity happening in the houses itself. So yeah, the food can be controlled, but again, if the, the shopping patterns also need to be addressed in terms of what people buy, what they eat. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to be multifactorial. And, and adding uh, to that, we're doing some multifactorial interventions in, in uh, Denmark, where one of them is actually using a bit of AI on the supermarket chains online advertising. So if they know a person has a high BMI and a um, comorbidity, uh, what will pop up initially in the suggestions are healthy foods. So that can actually be done in collaboration with, with food companies. But I, I also think it's important that the way we label our foods, if, if one company decides to add less salt, less sugar, and less fat, less fat, that company will lose if the others don't do the same. So having a systematic uh, harmonious or, or, or uh, similar labeling criteria across the, the food companies could make a big difference. Well, this is, yep. you know, to the voluntary targets on sodium, as an example, that is really what happened. You know, a large-scale effort uh, that we were proud to, to play a significant role in, in encouraging companies. And, you know, um, sodium, although not exactly on topic for obesity, but it's complex. You know, some food products need salt substances to be able to have a shelf life, right? Um, you know, the largest amount of sodium that people eat is actually in bread. 
bread. You know, most consumers don't understand that bread is the mm -hmm. largest place for getting sodium. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. And um, I might just mention one more solution that I think is really important, and this is something we and the Rockefeller Foundation in partnership with Kroger and Walmart and America's Health Insurance Plans and um, others in the United States are looking to create the broad scale, large evidence on food is medicine. You know, if we could integrate food into the healthcare system and have it prescribed by healthcare providers for those persons where healthy food could make a difference in their overall health and well being and have it reimbursed like drugs are reimbursed, that could be a dramatic change. Right now, there are many important um, programs that have demonstrated the effect. Um, to get insurance to cover this at a mass scale, at least in the United States, none of these programs have data that are, is long enough, um, and nor do we understand you know, which people for which <coughs> amount of time and what exact diet. So we are taking that on at the American Heart Association in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation, and we have announced a $250 million research study to create the definitive evidence to show that food can be integrated into the healthcare system, can be reimbursed like drugs, and can be cost effective to society. Well, I want to I just add two things. One, your initial question asked about regulation. Do we need more regulation? Um, I don't think that's the answer, um, in part because you know what we see in many cases is where we've tried to regulate, it's actually backfired in some cases. So um, I do think there's other ways to approach it. Um, one is making it easier. Um, we know that the way that things that are most successful, the internet works, is what you make easier people do. So if we make it easier, particularly for underserved communities, to get access to healthy foods, and that is subsidize healthy foods, make them available, um, that can have a dramatic impact. Um, right now, the easy thing to do, there's food deserts in many places, and you can't get anything but fast food. So that's what happens. So one, make it easy. In the, in the United States, we pay farmers not to grow certain foods and vegetables and the like. And if we reverse that and distribute those in underserved areas, I think that would be one. And second, Nancy already mentioned it, there's great companies, innovative companies out there. One is called Food Smart, but there's a lot of them out there that are starting to use technology and when you're using food stamps or other subsidized programs, they will actually do just what you said. They'll pop up these foods that are healthier and target uh, them to say they're available, they're easy to access. So I think that food as medicine is going to be a big industry. And uh, last but not least, we do need education because we have to make it very clear that, again, being healthy, which people want to do, they just don't know how to do it. And that seems counterintuitive, but it's really true. We have to make that front and center of what kids are taught from an early age. If you want to be vibrant, strong, healthy, successful, here's the foods to eat. So that would be, I think, I think healthcare it's a has become, solution. Healthcare has become more sick care. It's not at all looking at the wellness aspect. So mm -hmm. I think I'm of the opinion we need regulations, not restrictions. We need to encourage people. It, it, it's a problem which has to be addressed differently to different age groups. Mm -hmm. the, the kids need different uh, uh, calorie uh, labeling and stuff like that. The adults, grown-ups, different. So I think uh, we need to relook at the whole drawing board. We need to rewrite the rules of engagement. And as I said, I think GLP ones cannot be the only solution for this. No. So I'm afraid we're running out of time. But what I what I'm hearing is, first of all, GLP-1s are not the panacea we, we were hoping they were. Um, we need more data up and down this entire social problem. It's a societal systems issue. We need more education. We need to deal with, we need to focus on young people, catch them while they're still impressionable, while we can change their thinking and their habits. At the same time, don't forget the mothers, right? Um, and then we need to think more creatively about- Don't forget the fathers also. And don't forget those fathers. <coughs> but we need to think in, in creative and constructive ways about how government and industry can work together to solve this enormous growing 
problem. So thank you so much for sharing your insights to our panel and for helping us think about these solutions. And thank you. I'm sorry we only got to one question, but thank you for being here tonight.